uh, Galatians. So if you would turn to the second chapter of Galatians and we'll start there. Before we do though, we'll uh, join me in a short word of prayer. And Father, we thank thee for this time of study that we may become more knowledgeable of thy will for us. And we're grateful for Jesus who died for us and gave us the hope of eternal life. May we join with our brothers and sisters in Christ to uh, serve our master in a way that would be pleasing to him and pleasing to thee. Bless us in every right way and defeat us in evil. For this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Left off uh, last time at uh, verse two, but uh, we'll just start with verse one and just comment on it, on it very briefly. It says there, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And remember Titus was a uh, Gentile <clears throat> as opposed to Timothy who was had a Gentile father and a, and a Jewish mother. So, since it's kind of a matriarchal uh, uh, system there that he was also considered Jewish, but not Titus. Titus is, is a Gentile. <clears throat> and so he went up to, again, to Jerusalem because of a problem that they had with these Judaizing teachers coming down. And of course, that was the reason for the first chapter talking about the, uh, somebody preaches a different gospel than what Paul and the other apostles preach, you know, he's the anathema or cursed. So, but uh, somebody was coming down from Jerusalem and teaching this doctrine. So uh, the brethren there determined that uh, Paul and Barnabas and certain others, we don't know who they are, uh, they weren't named, but certain, uh, certain, certain others, they should go to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders there and and talk to them about this question. Now, let's keep in mind, they were not going there to decide the issue, whether the Judaizing teacher's message was correct. They had already determined that that was false doctrine and they were not about uh, to allow that to uh, uh, persuade the uh, brethren there at Antioch. So they were going to Jerusalem to find out you know, where are these guys coming from? And what are we going to do about it? <clears throat> so they did, and they uh, considered the matter. The, the uh, apostles there all concluded that, you know, we uh, believe that through the grace of God, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we shall be saved in the same manner as these uh, Gentiles. That being the case, the Gentiles did not have to be circumcised or obey the law of Moses. So the implication there is, whether they realize it or not, is that the Jews didn't either. So keeping the law of Moses, you know, you do it if you wanted to, but it didn't, as far as uh, your spiritual salvation, had nothing to do with it. So uh, that was finally concluded that, that uh, meeting in, in Jerusalem. So in verse 2, it says, uh, Paul says, and I went up by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preach, that, that's the, in the Greek, that's the present tense, which it means he, he continued to preach it. The gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, <clears throat> uh, but privately, he, he did this meeting privately. Uh, he didn't want to have to contend with the Judaizers. At the same time, he made the inquiry to those who were of reputation. That's uh, most likely the uh, leading apostle. Peter would certainly have to be included in that. He was not the head apostle, but certainly he was a leading apostle. Paul says, lest by any means I, I might run or had run in vain. <clears throat> of course, he was preaching the gospel, so he saw that these uh, Judaizing teachers were a danger to his 
ministry to the Gentiles. So he went up to, to Jerusalem by revelation of the Holy Spirit. And again, he did not go there to, to have the, the, the apostles decide whether the Gentile uh, Christians should be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. He already knew the answer to that one. So he just laid the issue of these Judaizing teachers coming down there and stirring up the church down there. And so he, he wanted to get the practice stopped. He wanted to find out who's doing it. And he wanted to get the practice stopped. And he says not even uh, Titus. Again, Titus was a Gentile <clears throat> who was with me uh, being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. He wouldn't allow him to be circumcised even though the Judaizing teachers were saying that he had to. And so Titus accompanied uh, Paul and Barnabas uncircumcised. So there was proof that uh, the Gentile did not have to be circumcised to be uh, pleasing to God under the uh, gospel of Christ. In verse four, it said, uh, and this occurred because of false teachers. And we have to conclude that those were the Judaizing teachers. And, you know, they were teaching a different gospel. That because of the false brethren secretly, and you, you recall the wolves and sheep's clothing, you know, wolves don't declare themselves to be wolves. They disguise themselves in sheep's clothing. So they did it secretly. He was secretly bought in. So who came by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ. And of course, uh, Galatians will speak often of the liberty that we have in Christ, Jesus Christ. That they may bring us again into bondage. <clears throat> the interesting thing is that the uh, Galatian Christians were already free from the bondage of the old law. But these wolves and sheep clothing were coming in so they may bring them under bondage of the law. The law had been done away with. The liberty one has uh, from bondage is uh, to the law. And we'll say more about that when we get to fifth chapter. <clears throat> but the whole point of the gospel was that it was superior to and uh, it replaced the law of Moses. If Paul were to have yielded on the uh, matter of circumcision, uh, that would be an admission that the gospel was an addendum to the law and not a replacement. So the matter of circumcision was only part of uh, to the larger question of, of which was now uh, which was the two were now in effect, the old law under which no one can be saved or the perfect law of liberty, the gospel of Christ. Well, of course, it's perfect law of liberty. In verse uh, five, uh, it says, to whom we did not yield submission. Uh, and this was a matter with that Paul would not compromise in the slightest. And even for an hour, not even for a moment, not even for a second. He wouldn't compromise at all. He wouldn't yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel, and of course the truth of the gospel was incompatible with the law of Moses, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. He didn't want what he had already taught them to be uh, destroyed. In verse six, it says, but uh, from those who seem to be something, uh, whatever they were, it's, it makes no difference to me. God shows a personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. Now, Paul was not as impressed with certain leaders as perhaps some thought he should be. You know, he hadn't been with Jesus, he had to prove his discipleship. So when he, let's say, came into the presence of Paul, he should have been really impressed. But it didn't matter to him. The truth of the gospel mattered to him. He already knew uh, the requisition to take on the matter of the Judaizers. 
He didn't need to be instructed about it from anyone. The apostles are included. And no matter how highly regarded they might be, truth was not and is not dependent on the importance or position of the person, in this case, including the apostles appointed before him. Truth is truth. He says in verse 7, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised, as the Gentiles, had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised, as the Jews, was to Peter. So those who seem to be something in verse uh, 6, and of course, in Dan and I and below, they recognize that the gospel to the Gentiles had been committed to Paul, and the gospel to the Jews, to Peter, and to his uh, fellow uh, apostles. The gospel was the same in both cases, but the uh, background of the people uh, to whom it was preached required a different approach. In Galatians, uh, second chapter, verse 8, says, for he who worked effect effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. It was the same gospel that Peter and Paul preached. God had inspired Peter to preach the gospel to the Jews and Paul to preach the same gospel to the Gentiles. Paul was as fully enabled to work miracles among the Gentiles as was Peter among the Jews. However, the methods employed to preach to the Jews because their background was different than that employed to preach to the Gentiles because they had a totally different background. Of course, this uh, preaching to the Jews and, and the Gentiles by Peter and Paul was not exclusively uh, there was not a, an exclusive approach to things. Gen uh, Paul generally started in the synagogues, and uh, Peter started with the conversion of Cornelius, a, a Gentile. <clears throat> in verse 9, it says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be, be pillars, uh, that uh, supports our, you know, pillars are supports. Of course, that's the leading men. Paul recognizes that they are the leading apostles to the Jews. Of course, the, the Judaizer, Judaizers would use this fact to deprecate Paul's uh, apostolic office, because he wasn't one of them. Now they, uh, Stephen, James, Cephas, and Paul, perceived the grace that had been given to me, and these three recognized and could not ignore the evidence and testimony that Paul was an apostle sent to the Gentiles. When they recognized that and perceived that grace given to, to Paul, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. And fellowship in this case, the right hand is indication of a friendship and trust. That's an indication to all the uh, Jews in particular of their approval of the work of Paul among the Gentiles. So they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they, they to the circumcised. <clears throat> and that's the way it was. But the gospel message, have to keep in mind, the gospel message of salvation was the same to both the Jew and Gentile. In Galatians, the second chapter, verse 10, <clears throat> they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Paul was eager for the Gentile brethren to help the poor of Judea as a means of bonding, bonding the two together in Christian fellowship. In Acts, the 11th chapter, verses 28 and 30, says there, then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. 
Cuban called Saul at that time. In the 11th verse, we read, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I, was, uh, was, uh, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. And the ASV says that he stood condemned, and so it was. <clears throat> So he, here, Paul is now again in Antioch. Uh, we read about that again in, in Acts 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 35, if you want to look at that, look that up. Paul's apostleship was independent of any human authority. There had been an agreement in this uh, Jerusalem conference that his commission as the apostle to the Gentiles was a divine one. This incident with uh, Peter demonstrated his apostolic credentials as being equal to the other apostles. <clears throat> so this gives an important illustration of the manner in which uh, public reproof should be conducted. It was done openly and addressed frankly to the offender, since the offense itself was done openly and in public. <clears throat> so what was the offense? So I read about that beginning verse 12. For before, before certain men came from James, and of course their names are not mentioned, but uh, apparently they were emissaries from James. And you know, James is not included in the rebuke, uh, nor is it said, though it may be implied, that these Jews expected that Peter would separate himself. So he said, for certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, Peter would. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So Peter sat down with the Gentiles to eat, but when the Jews sent by John came, uh, James, when they came, uh, he parted company with the Gentiles. He separated himself. He didn't want to be seen with them. Now Peter could not have been ignorant that God had accepted the Gentiles into the system of grace that is the gospel. As you remember, Cornelius, this had been made clear to him some 10 years earlier upon the conversion of Cornelius. And again, at the Jerusalem conference, he was not to be blamed for ignorance, but because of hypocrisy. He knew that God had accepted the Gentiles equally into the church, but he withdrew himself so as not to offend the Jew, the, um, this Jewish prejudice, if you will, against the uh, Gentiles. <clears throat> Now, this was not the first time that Peter had to contend with those of the circumcision. In Acts uh, 11, chapter verses 2 and 3, it says there, and when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. So, you know, because of this, he may have been a little gun shy here. And whatever it was, his fears got the better of him. You recall that his, uh, it was his fear that caused him to deny Christ three times. So no doubt his actions then, as well as this time, did not reflect his inner convictions. He knew better. <clears throat> In verse 13, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrites with him, whoever they were. So that even Barnabas, uh, who was Paul's companion, was carried away with their hypocrisy. So there were others, including Barnabas, who engaged in the same hypocrisy of which Peter was guilty. Again, they, they're not named. Bar Barnabas was reared among the Gentiles on Cyprus and had, with Paul, labored among them. But he got caught up in the moment. And this is a warning against uh, theological compromise, whatever the circumstances may be. <clears throat> In verse 14, it says, but 
but I saw that they were not straightforward <clears throat> in uh, King James and ASB, it says walked uprightly. In the Greek, the Greek says it has the idea to be straight footed, that, you know, to go directly forward. <clears throat> when they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, <clears throat> if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles, you know, he had freely associated with the uh, Gentiles. And not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Well, would he can compel the Jewish Christian brethren to live as did the Jewish Christians when they were present? Paul saw immediately that the truth of the gospel was at stake. And he had to act right then, he couldn't wait. <clears throat> if Peter's conduct was allowed to stand, this withdrawal of so called table fellowship from uh, Gentile Christians would confirm that the law, at least certain elements of it, took precedence over one's relationship to Christ through the gospel. It is entirely plausible that Paul repented of this sin rather than uh, compound his it by his obstinance. As you know, we read in Second Peter uh, chapter three, verse fifteen, he referred to Paul as his beloved brother Paul. So I have no doubt he uh, repented of this sin, <clears throat> just not recorded in, in, uh, in uh, Galatians. In verse 15 of chapter 2 said, we who are Jews by nature are not sinners of the Gentiles. And Paul was speaking from the perspective of the Jewish Christians. Uh, they now know things spoken of in verse 16, which we'll get to. But they were born Jews and not the offspring of adulterers and heathens, which uh, the Jews considered uh, the Gentiles to be, to be idolaters, idolaters and heathens, not, not the chosen race. By accepting Christ, they admitted, <clears throat> that's the uh, Judaizers, they admitted that they were not justified by the old law. <clears throat> Verse 16 says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And the Jewish Christians knew this, but they'd been taught this. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. The Jewish Christian should have known that a man is not justified by the works of the law of Moses, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul is clearly showing that the Judaizers insistence on keeping the old law was at variance with their own knowledge of the gospel. Justification was not possible as a matter of law, but as a matter of faith in the Christ and the grace available through it. You know, the Judaizers and the, the uh, Galatian Christians had all been taught this. <clears throat> Verse 17, but if we, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? And he gives an emphatic certain not. <clears throat> In Romans, the ninth chapter, verses 30 and 31, it reads there, what shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness, righteousness of faith, but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. So this, this is saying that uh, 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 the law, has, particularly more in particular a law system, does not uh, make one righteous. It's uh, the righteousness of faith. <clears throat> and 
Israel, of course, they had a law of uh, righteousness. Uh, they had a law, but if they're pursuing a law of righteousness, they're not, they not attaining it through the law, the old law, the law of ordinances. The Jew considered the Gentile to be a sinner. You know, they wouldn't have much to do with them. By seeking to be justified by Christ, you know, the Jew had to admit that he was as much a sinner as the Gentile. Did the belief in Christ then make the Jew a sinner? That's an emphatic no. <clears throat> He says in verse 18, for if I build again those things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. And you recall that the old law was uh, nailed to the cross, taken out of the way, Colossians 2.14. If uh, Paul was to build up again the old law, then he would be a transgressor of the gospel. They were incompatible with each other. The real transgressor is the one who knows better, but surrenders to the legal and ritual practices that were rejected when he obeyed Christ. This applied to both Peter and his companions, the Galatian brethren. It is true that Paul had Timothy circumcised. You know, as I said, his mother was Jewish and, and the matriarchal uh, system, uh, the children were considered whatever the mother was. Mother's Jewish, so Timothy was considered Jewish, and Paul was uh, uh, meeting Jewish people, and it'd be the question of whether or not uh, Timothy, being a Jew, considered a Jew, was why was he not circumcised? But he wasn't circumcised because. Paul was requiring Timothy to keep the law, but rather it was a exercise in Christian liberty. You know, he was doing those things that are not wrong in and of themselves. Nobody ever said circumcision was uh, circumcision was wrong in and of itself, but they were expedients to the cause of Christ. Circumcising Timothy was an expedient, not a commandment. Verse 19, he says, for, for, uh, for I, through the law, died to the law, that I might live to God. Now, the law was a tutor, a schoolmaster that uh, brought Paul to Christ. But once he put on Christ in baptism, he died to the law. As a purely legalistic system, a pure law system, the law could teach but he could not save. In Romans, the seventh chapter, verse four, it says, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law of the body of Christ, that you may be buried, married to another, to him was raised, who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. <clears throat> Paul writes in uh, verse 20 of uh, Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ, is one that you all know. It's uh, no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul was crucified with Christ, <clears throat> that his old self was uh, died in baptism, and his old self died, and he was raised to walk news to life. He died the law. He was raised from orders of baptism to walk in newness of life in Christ and not in the old law. It was the sins of man, Gentile and Jew alike, that made the sacrifice of Christ on the cross necessary. <clears throat> Paul acknowledges here that it was his sins, apart from the sins of the Gentiles and other Jews, that made the sacrifice of Christ on the cross necessary. And that's one thing we should keep in mind. If everybody had lived uh, perfectly, had never sinned, everybody else had never sinned, but you did, <clears throat> Christ still had to die on the cross. 
<clears throat> and that uh, also states that Paul now states that he lives by faith in Christ rather in the old law rather than through a, a purely law system and a pure law system could demand forbid, it could judge it could condemn but it could not save In verse 21, <clears throat> he says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. <clears throat> it's the grace of God that makes uh, all of this uh, possible. It's not the old law. If righteousness were attainable through the works of the old law, then the redemptive act of the sacrifice of Christ was meaningless and unnecessary. So beginning with uh, verse 3, uh, Paul has concluded his self-defense of his uh, apostolic authority. Uh, he's already demonstrated that his apostleship was of a divine origin and his apostolic authority <clears throat> was not dependent in any way or to any extent on any of the other apostles. In doing so, he also defended the gospel that he delivered to the Galatians. <clears throat> and from here, beginning in verse uh, chapter one, uh, verse chapter three, verse one, he uh, further defends the gospel. <clears throat> he used pretty direct language. He says, "Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth?" before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. That's the gospel that was preached by Paul to them. Yeah, <clears throat> interesting question might be, why were the Galatians so fascinated by the message from the Judaizers? And I don't think the Galatians were stupid people, but apparently they did not employ their rational senses or they would never have allowed themselves to even entertain for a moment the absurd position promoted by the Judaizers. They were, in every sense of the word, foolish. The term crucified uh, means more than just Christ died. He said, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you, among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And in 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1, verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And then in verse uh, 23 of that same uh, chapter, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block into the Greeks foolishness. And in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse three and four, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking to me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you, for though he was cru crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Well, it was abundantly evident that, uh, to the Galatians that Jesus Christ was crucified as uh, a propitiation for their sins. And by his resurrection from death on the cross, they could have forgiveness of sins. And they could thereby look forward to their spiritual house not made with hands. This was not the case under the Jewish system. The clause that you should not obey the truth is not in the Greek text, nor are the words among you. These are not included in the uh, American Standard Version. The Texas Receptus includes these phrases, but the eclectic text, which is a combination of various uh, manuscripts, do not. That's the uh, uh, Nestle Leyland in the United Bible Society's text, Greek New Testaments. 
uh, that notwithstanding, clearly the context implies that their actions caused them to disobey or at least forget the truth they had formerly accepted. <clears throat> so that clause was in, included because that's the implication of it. Of it. And that's a, a decision of the translators. In the second verse of chapter three, <clears throat> said this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? <clears throat> Did the Galatians receive spiritual gifts? Well, that's in, certainly implied in verse five below. I'm going to get to that. The gospel was not originally in written form. We know that, but was contained in men. If you you can see that through the old twelfth chapter of 1 Corinthians, which we're not going to read here. In Ephesians, the first chapter verses 17 and 18 it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of his of the glory of his inheritance in the saints so that was uh indication of the spiritual gifts spirit of wisdom and revelation <clears throat> and we know the uh, passage in the uh, second chapter of Joel, verses 28 and 30 through, says, uh, Come to pass, you know, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and so forth, and so on. Suddenly, your daughter shall prophesy. That was, of course, uh, fulfilled in Acts, the second, second chapter, verse 16, because it says, This was that. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass. In the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And these are all uh, spiritual gifts. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. And so forth and so on. <clears throat> uh, was the spirit received under the old law? Uh, not like it was here. It was received under the gospel. And there were certain... Uh, prophets and men of the Old Testament that could uh, work laws and certainly was revelation in the Old Testament, but the spiritual gifts that uh, spoken of in, in, the, in Corinthians, it, it was received here in the gospel. <clears throat> and again, he says in uh, verse 3 of uh, chapter 3, are you so foolish? That word again, foolish. Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Well, they had trusted in Christ because they became Christians and they had received uh, from that uh, obedience to Christ the benefits and manifestation of the spirit. And they were foolishly, and all that implies, turning from the law of the spirit of life in Christ <clears throat> that made them free from the law of sin and death, Romans uh, 8, chapter verse 2, to the Jewish law that was concerned only with food and drinks, various washing and fleshly ordinances imposed to the time of Reformation, Hebrews the 9, chapter verse 10. So for them to embrace the old law, that's a that was a fleshly law based on fleshly services and fleshly ordinances, and to do that was to reject the spirit. The answer, therefore, to the question that Paul posed uh, was no. Yeah, to conclude otherwise would have been the logical foolishness in which <clears throat> the, the uh, uh, Galatians seem to have some practical knowledge of foolishness. In verse 4 of chapter 3, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? No doubt the Galatian Christians suffered uh, persecution because of their Christian faith. Some at the hands of the Jews and some at the hands of the Gentiles. Trials and tribulations have their place 
in the development of the Christ, uh, Christian uh, spirit and nature. In Romans, the fifth chapter, verses three through five, we'll read there. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character of hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who gave, who was given to us. So it, it appears that they uh, have suffered many things. Paul says so. So was their suffering in vain? If they forsook the faith which they suffered, it would uh, be in vain. An analogy would be, uh, present day analogy would be to adopt socialism after having defeated national socialism in World War II and communism in 1990. They would make those defeats pointless. So can we who reap the benefits of those who restored the church in the 19th and 20th centuries now surrender those principles that guided them? Well, obviously the answer to that is also no, we can't do it. Well, it's the bottom of the, the hour, so uh, we'll stop here at uh, Galatians 3rd chapter, verse 5, and, and take that up next week. Thank you.